All right, well, let, let's bring in our guest. Um, he's, he's written for Forbes magazine, Knicks fan, NBA reporter, Tommy Beard joining us. Pleasure to have you, Tommy. How you, how you feeling today, man? Happy Saturday, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me, fellas. Uh, happy to be on. And uh, yeah, a little a uh, little bit nicer out here in the New York City area. A little sunshine out today, so uh, good to see. Absolutely, man. Beautiful day in the neighborhood, and uh, beautiful day to talk Knicks indoors. I guess, right? I always go to Tommy for the stats, man. That's my yo. That's my Tommy stats. is <laughs> the man when it comes to the stat. Yo, Tommy, do you have like an Elias Sports Bureau encyclopedia that you just like plug That's into your back of your head, like the Matrix or something? How That's do you fact. come up with these stats, man? <laughs> I wish we need more of your stats than anybody else. Facts, man. Facts. <laughs> Appreciate it, fellas. Appreciate that. Uh, a lot of it's basketball reference stuff. Um, yeah, I just uh, always had a, a love for statistics, numbers. Um, and I think, uh, obviously, they don't tell the whole story, as uh, Nick's Twitter is quick to remind you if you tweet anything negative yes, about yes. Uh, one, of the, one of the players. But um, I think they help paint a picture. You know, no one particular stat is going to give you everything you need to know. Um, but I think it's beneficial to kind of get a view of um, – each player where he's at in a particular time and give you a little bit of a historical context, uh, you know, how well they're playing in comparison to other rookies or other Nick rookies, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I, I, obviously it's not the be all end all um, numbers. And, and as many people point out, you can skew any type of statistic, right. to, you know, to kind of fit whatever narrative you want to tell. I just kind of like to put the numbers out there and let people decide for themselves. I don't, you know, obviously they're going to support some viewpoints and, 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 uh, you know, uh, prove some other viewpoints possibly wrong in the, mm -hmm. in the short term at least. Um, but I think at least having those numbers help inform the discussion. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that, man. And, and one guy putting up a lot of numbers, you just wrote your last article on him. That's, that's money. Mitchell Robinson, man. Yeah. Um, 23 straight games with a block shot. His last six games coming into this one, 12 points, 10 boards, four blocks, 73% field goal shooting. Uh, you know, his block numbers are, are in the categories of David Robinson, Shaquille O'Neal. What's, what's your general take on, on Mitchell Robinson's season so far? Um, it's really, you know, you, you try to kind of temper your optimism and, and try to keep things in perspective with young players. He's a 20-year-old kid. Mm-hmm as we know, didn't play a second of organized basketball last season, but um, he's really playing at a ridiculously high level right now. When you factor in his limited playing time, you know, I was just, just before I hopped on here, I was looking at the numbers um, over the next last seven games. Of course you were. His, his, <laughs> his per 36 minutes are insane. 16.3 points, 14.7 rebounds, 5.3 blocks per 36. All right, that's good, obviously. We know yeah. that that's crazy. The block rate is ridiculous, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. For me, what may be the most impressive number for Mitch Robinson post-All-Star break, this dude is shooting 80% from the free throw line. Wow. So, so he's making 70% of his field goals on the season – and he's shooting 80% from the free throw. I mean, you just don't see that type of efficiency. There's only been two players in NBA history that have shot 70% from the floor for a season. That's Wilt Chamberlain and, and DeAndre Jordan. <laughs> Damn. Damn. Both that of those is guys, crazy, man. That's crazy. Jordan, shot, Jordan shot below 50% from the free throw line in all three of those years. In the 40s and in the 30s one time. And uh, and Wilt was like 51% or something from the free throw line. So if 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 uh, um, Mitch Rob can shoot, let's say, 65%, 70% consistently um, from the free throw line, you just don't see the type of, you know, there's a comp uh, Clint Capella comparison as mid, mid made yeah. uh, quite often. Um, I think that's a dude that is similar in, in a lot of respects. Um, but, yeah, if Robinson can continue to perform efficiently, you know, remember, this is a guy that's averaging a double-double, and the Knicks never run a play for him. Yeah, right, right. Everything's off garbage offensive rebounds, putbacks, hustle points. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen it just a little bit more frequently when he's been doing a little bit better job rim running and, and, and you know, pushing his guy underneath the basket, catching, and turn around than Duncan. Um, so I think once the Knicks start to run a few plays for him, that's going to increase his scoring average. 
Um, but yes, to you know, it's a long story short to your to answer your question. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if you redrafted the 2018 draft right now, we'd probably be drafting the lottery. Um, and he really has a tremendous upside. And obviously, the kind of the cherry on the top for the Knicks organization is that he's locked into a ridiculously affordable contract. Going to be making less than two million each of the next three years, which is um, incredibly valuable for the organization. I, you were going to say some jails. Nah, I want to say shout out to Ninja P for pulling off that move. Ninja P, that's what we call Scott Perry here. <laughs> yeah, shout out to Ninja P. that's Scott Perry's <laughs> nickname. I mean, listen, man, you, you got to give these guys credit. I also saw that in his senior year, uh, Rivals.com had him, I think, in the top 10 yep. or top six ahead of Kevin Knox and yes. maybe one yeah, below was, DSJ. Had mm. he played, he, it was he, the, the full story as to why he left Western Kentucky during mm. his freshman year has never been told. It's kind of some mystery around it. Um, but for whatever reason, he obviously didn't play his freshman season at the NCAA level, trained on his own. Had it not been for that, as you mentioned, he was you know, ranked right, you know, based on the rankings. He was with Colin Sexton and uh, ahead of Kevin Knox and Wendell Carter Jr. All those guys were neck and neck in the rankings. So he would have been a lottery pick, had he, even if he had played poorly, based on potential, athleticism, height, all that, all that stuff. Um, and he actually shot threes you know, at, at a decent clip in yeah. high school. Um, so yeah, if, had he played, he, he obviously wouldn't have slipped into the second round, let alone the second half of the, the first round. Um, so, you know, credit to Scott Perry and the Knicks for, for scooping him up at 36 overall. A- absolutely, man. Um, let's, let's swing it to the draft. That was another article that you, that you had released earlier this week or last week. Uh, you released your first mock draft of the season. Uh, Knicks, obviously right now we are waning between the first and the fifth pick according to the tankathon. Um, let, let's start with the obvious, the, 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 the guy in the room, Zion Williamson. What, what's your take on Zion? Who, who's your NBA comparison to Zion out of, out of curiosity? I, I mean, I guess, you know, you know, some freakish combination of Barkley and, and Sean Kemp and, um, mm. you know, it's just, it, I think it's really difficult to kind of put him into a category or, or try to come up with a comparable player because he's such a unique specimen. Um, as I mentioned in that, in that, in, in that mock, actually, Dude, is, is, his listed playing weight is 285 pounds. That was insane to I mean, read. That's, I mean, that's, 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 that's 20 pounds heavier than Embiid. That's Oliver Miller. You, say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, Charles Oakley, that's 40 pounds heavier than Oakley and, and 30 pounds heavier than Ewing, um, you know, for, for, for some Nick comparison. So it's really difficult. To, I mean, just to have a, a man with that type of – at that playing weight, but to be as explosive and as quick – um, obviously, I, I, there are there are flaws there. Um, I think there's kind of two schools of thought. You know, um, some folks that have just seen the highlights and the YouTube and the Instagram stuff think, "Oh my God, he's the next uh, Jordan or LeBron or Tim." Do-. He's not on those guys' level in terms of franchise altering talent. You know, mm-hmm. um, his, his shot mm-hmm. needs a lot of work. His mechanics, his elbow flies way out. You're right. um, I'd be surprised if he shot anything higher than 25, 30% for three point territory um, as a rookie or, you know, his first few years in the league. But um, so that being said, he's not, he's not on those guys level. That being said to me, he's the no brainer number one overall pick just because his upside is so ridiculously high. He's going to get points in transition every single Easy, night. Yeah. He's mm-hmm. a menace in the open court. And to me, what makes him so special is his defensive versatility. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of some some folks that I don't think watch too much NBA, the, the Mike Francesas of the world yeah. um, <laughs> and, and, and the like, <laughs> complain he doesn't have a position in yes. the NBA. And, and listen, I'm a fan of Mike, man. I'm, I'm a huge fan of the Pope. But I just, you know, what do you think when he says that, that he has no position in, in the NBA? How do you feel about that? I, I love Mike. Mike's my dude. I've been watching him since he was since I was a little kid. Absolutely. But he, clearly, he clearly just doesn't watch as much NBA basketball as, as a guy that has a, a primetime show on yeah. in New York should watch. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's that's a story for another day. Uh, but yeah, when he so when guys like Francesa they'll say he doesn't have a he doesn't have a position in the NBA. He doesn't play center. He doesn't play small forward. In two, how are you going to talk about positions in 2019 in the NBA? I mean, yeah. that's kind of that's the story of the NBA today is that positionless basketball to get guys that can kind of you know flow back and forth from small forward to power forward to center. Um, you know, the best team in, in arguably NBA history often starts Draymond Green, an undersized six seven right. small forward at center. Um, so yeah, I, so when you get a guy like Zion Williamson that can has the strength. Uh, and the bulk to box out and, you know, defend the paint down low, but also switch one, five pick and rolls and stay in front of quick perimeter players. 
um, out on the top of the key. That's a really, really valuable player. Um, when you watch him, he plays hard, has a high motor. He could have crew. He put could have put it on cruise control and went to like a UCLA or some other right. school. But he wanted to play for Coach K. They get after it defensively. So um, I think again, I think he's a no-brainer number one overall pick. And, and I obviously, like all of us, extremely excited. I think if he came to New York, there would be such a palpable buzz in the Box city. Box office, man. Would have been a beautiful thing to see. Question about his weight, though. You know, a lot of people said they want him to lose weight because they feel like it might be an injury risk. But do you feel like he should? Because, you know, the fact that he is that size and and that heavy, it allows him to bang with these other guys. So I, here's the thing. What do you think about him losing weight? Is that have to happen? Or you feel like he can just kind of play around the way he is? I'm sure once he gets into an NBA locker room and medical training staff and all that stuff, um, they'll probably shed them, you know, a couple pounds. The other thing to do, the other thing to remember is uh, muscle weighs more than fat. So this is, it's not like he's lugging around, you know, 15 pounds of muscle around his belly. Mm. He just happens to be a physical freak in, in terms of his, you know, um, you know, his, his, his build. That's just kind of, he's been playing at that weight. Um, and obviously he had the, the knee injury now due to the, uh, the shoe, you know, his, the shoe Exploding. wardrobe yeah. malfunction. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I mean, his probable NBA playing weight is probably closer to 275 than 285, but it's definitely not like he's got to lose 20 pounds. You know, yeah. I, I think they're, they're comfortable where he's at. Okay. Um, another guy who's intriguing, this is the guy who you have uh, slotted at the Knicks at the two. Obviously, he's more than likely the, the front runner for the two spot right now in the draft. That's R.J. Barrett. Uh, what, mm -hmm. What's your overall opinions on, on R.J. Barrett and how he could potentially fit with us? Sure. Um, I think Barrett is uh, uh, one thing you got to remember is he's actually the number one recruit in his high school yes. class. Yep. He was right ahead of Zion on everybody's list. Um, you know, uh, more of a, you know, he's definitely an NBA ready player. He's been playing at a very high level, um, you know, internationally for Canada the last few years. Mm -hmm. uh, and has performed very well. A better all-around player than Zion. Um, the only player in the country averaging uh, at least 20 points, seven rebounds, and four assists per game. Um, so it kind of gives you an idea of what exactly he can bring to the table. Um, needs to improve, you know, a little bit as a facilitator. Yeah. Um, this deep, yeah. defensive effort kind of waxes and wanes. It's, it's probably not where you'd like to be. Um, but, uh, you know, sees the floor well, is an unselfish player. Um, so I, I think of uh, – he actually probably is a little bit of a safer pick um, right. than Zion Williamson but but as we talked about even if even if the GM all the scouts in an organization say listen I, I think I'm probably leaning towards RJ Barrett mm -hmm. you know the owner of whatever team has the number one pick is going to be like yo we got the number one pick we're about to sell like 10 million jerseys and, yeah. and sell out the tickets so Zion's the number one pick but um, uh, I, I think uh, RJ Barrett is a very good consolation prize whatever team gets a number two overall pick mm -hmm. yeah I mean I, I see you know a lot of fans like to you know uh, compare the, the the similarities with Timmy in terms of his terrible shot selection and his tunnel vision. Um, but you know, I like the points that you made in your article with the numbers that he's putting up. He's he's doing it at Duke. He's yeah. you know at the creme de la creme. He, he's playing at an elite level. I still like his mindset. You know, I, I just like the way he he attacks the game. Yes, you know, the defense leaves a lot to be desired, and and yes, the tunnel vision you can see it, and sometimes he does force the issue, but. I, I, I feel like he, he has potential to be to be really good at the next level. Agreed. Um, yeah, he's definitely not, a, a, you know, a Tim Hardaway um, one dimensional player because he, if he doesn't score, if he goes into shooting slumps, he still can impact the game defensively. Um, he's a decent rebounder for a player his size, um, a solid passer. Um, so he's definitely a lot more versatile, proven winner. Um, a lot to like there with RJ Barrett. Absolutely, man. Another guy that you had uh, shot up on your boards is Jared Culver. He's a guy that a lot of people think his stock is rising a bit. Mm -hmm. I'll talk a little bit about Jared Culver, what you like about him. Yeah, he's a two guard out of Texas Tech. Um, you know, he's kind of a, an afterthought in terms of a lottery pick, you know, at the start of the season, but he's played really well for Texas Tech. He's a really safe player in terms of what he brings to the table. He's uh, Texas Tech is one of the top defensive teams in the country, and he's arguably one of the better perimeter defenders in the country. Um, you know, does a great job on both ends of the ball. Prototypical two guard in terms of size, six five, close to a seven foot wingspan. Um, can get out, can, can get out in transition. He's also been playing a lot of point guard for Texas Tech and mm. kind of facilitating their offense. Um, he doesn't have the same upside of Barrett. Um, he probably won't be a 20. He could be, you know, develops as, as a high end, you know, a low 20 point score. But that's probably a best case scenario. 
probably settle into like an 18 pointer range, um, mm-hmm. but also, you know, average six, seven assists a game. Um, so, and, and also, you know, just as importantly is, a, is, is the best, is, is a better defender than, than Barrett, according to most scouts. So mm-hmm. uh, I, I think he's probably in the, in the four to five range, John ja Morant. Um, you know, the reason I had Culver going three in my mock was that if the Cavs fall to three, it'll be very interesting to see what they do, um, considering they drafted Colin Sexton at eight last year. Yeah. Um, okay. So I think Culver is um, – I pro- I personally would take Culver ahead of Cam Reddish at this point. Um, so I have him four, uh, you know, on my big board, so to speak, um, with John Morant, uh, number three. Okay. Okay. Right. Go ahead, uh, JLC. You had some? No, I was just saying, is it, was, is it the Cam Reddish is shooting that's kind of, you know, kind of – tilting you towards Culver? Yeah, I just, uh, I, the more I watch a Reddish, I mean, listen, you look at him on, on paper, he's everything you want in an NBA wing. Six, yeah. nine, great length. Can You know, you look at his highlights, can put the ball on the floor, um, you know, just, you know, grab an, a defensive rebound, push it all the way up the court, Euro step, N1, strong around the basket. But his shooting percentage is, you don't want to put too much stock in, you know, it's a limited sample size, you know, 25 games or so on his freshman season. But um, they're just very worrisome. Uh, you know, he scored in double digits, I think, four of the last eight games. Um, hasn't stepped up as much as you like without Zion Williamson there. Um, you know, uh, the best case scenario, he has that, you know, that T-Mac look to him. Um, you know, just that kind of what you hope that you, you know, what scouts drool over in a, in mm. a wing in today's NBA. Um, and when he really focuses and locks in defensively, um, he can, he, he put, you know, just those, those games, those moments are too few, few and far in between. Yeah. Um, he's too talented to slip too far in the lottery. So I doubt he slips past five or six. Um, but I think if you, if you take him, um, you know, and miss out on one of those top three guys, top four guys, I, I think there is a drop off. That, that scouting report sounds like Kevin Knox, Shales. I was about to say the same <laughs> thing. Like the guys with the mind the issues who don't really have the that 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 I want to do it mentality. I, I was like, do I want to go through that two years in a row? I'm not sure. I, I agree with you. I think yeah. Knox, you know, for better or for worse, is is a good comparison from especially his college tape. Mm. <laughs> a- interesting, interesting. Um, you had mentioned John ja Morant. And, with, you know, the Knicks are obviously in kind of a point guard conundrum. We bring in DSJ. We don't know where they stand with Moutier. Uh, they keep, you know, Frank is always popping up in the trade rumors. You have the Kyrie stuff, Kemba a little bit less so. But in the draft, you have namely John Morant and to a lesser degree, um, Darius Garland. How do you compare both those players and, and how do you compare those players to, to drafting them over a DSJ if the Knicks were to go that route? Sure. Um, I think Garland's going to slip. If the Knicks, you know, assuming they finish with the worst record, obviously they're not going to drop past five, and I think it would be a major reach to take Garland at five. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I don't, so I don't think he's in the conversation. I suppose he could be um, if they if they slip to five and they don't like Reddish and they're not in love with Culver, but um, that would definitely be a reach. Um, as far as Morant, 6'3", um, um, athleticism through the roof, um, you know, kind of a Russell Westbrook clone in terms of, a, um, you know, just the, the, the athleticism, uh, the determination, the aggressiveness he plays with, especially on the offensive end. A little bit slight of build. He's like 170, 175 pounds, probably needs to bulk up a little bit. Mm. Um, you know, in terms of a slashing, penetrating point guard, um, he's what you want in today's NBA. Um, his three-point shot's a little bit unreliable. Mechanics aren't terrific. Um, you know, you'd like to see him improve that a little bit, you know, if, if he gets in the gym and, you know, works with a shooting coach, et cetera. Um, but I think um, can also a def- you know, good defender, um, you know, you know not, not a great off-ball defender, but, he, you know, does a pretty good job, um, you know, keeping staying in front of his man, obviously has the ale- a- athleticism and, and quickness to spare. Um, so I think if the Knicks are in that three or four range um, and uh, obviously uh, Zion Williamson and Barrett are off the board, uh, Morant is the guy they should target. Um, at that point, I try to trade Dennis Smith Jr. Hmm. Uh, if not, keep him, uh, you know, keep him in, in house and, and figure out, you know, who starts next year. You know, maybe have Morant come off the bench behind DSJ. Um, I don't. I'm not in love with with Dennis Smith Jr.'s game. Hmm. Uh, I just don't know if he's a pure guy you want to lead in the franchise, especially in the best case scenario um, where you get KD in town. Um, you know, whether you know whether you add somebody else. Um, uh, Kyrie, I'm a little bit nervous about. I heard you guys talking yeah. um, before I hopped on. I, I think there are reasons to be concerned about um, how Kyrie would fare, you know, kind of under the media scrutiny in New yeah. York. 
Um, but um, but I guess in, in direct, you know, assuming leaving those guys out of the conversation, I, I think you have to you have an opportunity to draft Moran. I think you have to do it, um, even if you have Dennis Smith Jr. on the roster. Um, Smith's already in his, you know, this will be his um, finishing up his uh, second. second so he only has two years left on his rookie scale deal. Mm. At some point, you're going to have to figure out, do I want to extend this guy? Um, you know, how much am I going to pay him the year? Is he worth a $15 million a year player? Um, you know, defensively, as we saw today, um, the numbers look good, 17-5-5. Five and five, But what did De'Aaron Fox do? Pumped yeah. in 30 points and put on a show. I love De'Aaron Fox, man. Yeah. Oh, just a mat. It just it 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 pains. I'm sure it pains Nick fans. Um, if they had the opportunity to draft the Aaron Fox, where where the you know how much? Oh, love yeah. But that's a story for another day as well. Um, but but to my point, um, you know, Fox ate Smith's lunch. Yeah, he did. Um, that, that's the kind of thing. Even when you put up 17 points, um, I think he you, you know need you know was, uh, shot a poor percentage, nine of 17, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, that that's kind of the good and bad. The numbers look decently, but the, the plus minus isn't ideal. Um, so yeah, I think if you have the I, I have the opportunity to draft Jay Moran. Yeah, to do it. go for it. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting, Jail. So you know what I mean? Because yeah. like you said, we really don't know where they stand on these guards. And as much as I'm with the pick the best player available at your slot, I just wonder if, if they would um, still go with, with Moran. But uh, I support yeah. that. I, I definitely support it. I can see the Knicks doing that PR move when they drop when they draft Moran and then give that. Well, you know, we have full confidence that Dennis Smith Jr. Like, don't know if you do that. No, they got to start with Frank first, Tails. <laughs> they got to start all the way at the bottom. Oh, man. T- Tommy, how you looking on time, man? I'm good. I'm good. Keep firing away, fellas. Okay. All right. Um, let- let's take a call. Let's go to Kevin from North Carolina. He, he watches a lot of Duke and-, and UNC. Kevin wants to talk about the, the offseason plans. Kevin, how you feeling, bro? What's up? What's up? Can you hear me? Yep. Loud and clear, yep. bro. Hey, man, first off, I got to start off like this, man. I know y'all been talking about it already, mm-hmm. but, man, we messed up not thinking the right way a couple of years ago back, man. We should have <laughs> had Fox, man. We started winning those games for no reason a couple of years ago. We messed around and drafted Frank. <laughs> yeah, well, we Fox went uh, three, Fox man. went fifth to the Kings. Went fifth I still to the remember Kings. the Endor game winner. Yeah, man. Endor. <laughs> no game for no reason. Ugh. But, um, the, the, but, the, but the, um, the question I had was... um. And I'd like to get um um, Tommy. um all of you guys' point of view. Okay. You, um J L stand on Tommy. Uh, what would what would you guys uh, view of a failed off season be? Like mine would be like six picks and we waste our money on like we max out some dude averaging like eighteen and five. Like that would be my scenario. <laughs> yeah. of, like a failed off season. I, well, I want to see what you guys think about that. Tom, Tommy, go ahead and, and kick that off, man. What's your idea of a bad off season? Yeah, I think Kevin's got the it, it, the important thing is the worst case scenario for the Knicks this offseason is not striking out completely in free agency. The worst case scenario for the Knicks this offseason is spending poorly. Yeah. You know, because yeah. you have seventy million dollars to spend. That doesn't mean you gotta max out Boogie and, oh, and Kevin. Please no, no, right, no, right. no Boogie, Lord, man. You know what I'm saying? Like you gotta if you don't get KD. Then you got to reassess the entire situation, and do we kick that money, you know, towards next season, or do we trade for an expiring contract and get back another first round pick? Yeah, um, I think that's the important point. JLS, go ahead, bro. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with with uh, Tommy here. Just don't max anybody out, and more importantly, the years. I think that's even more important. Like, like if you overpay a little bit for like right. for a short term deal, then. All right, I won't be as mad, you know. We trying to stay afloat, look competitive for a season or so. But you can't over, you can't max somebody out for four or five years. That's like not, that's not, this is not it. We can't max out like a, a second tier star, and yeah. then we just have another, you know, another, another Tim Hardaway Jr. situation. Yeah, no, I I agree with that. Both both points I agree with. Um, right. I don't want to tie the success of this Porzingis trade to this offseason. I hope they don't put pressure on themselves to do that. I've been saying that. So my idea True. is, um, you know, let's say we get the fifth of the sixth pick and then we max out a Vucevic or, you know, some, somebody like that. Yeah. Boogie Cousins and Jimmy Butler. Oh, man. Please. Yeah, don't, max right. don't, don't do it, man. Just continue the course. Listen, if it's going to get ugly, it's going to get ugly, but just keep that flexibility. And as Tommy said, you have the cap space that you can use as a weapon to purchase a guy on a terrible contract to get more 
um, assets. You know, that that's the thing. If we're going to be building yeah. slowly, we we got to also be thinking of, of bringing in more assets and, and building the fortress. Right, right. I was going to say right. how good the Thanks, mission is. And also, um, my last question for, um, yeah. for Tommy, and um, you can um, end the call after this, but okay. I want to see what he thinks about it. If we fall out the top three, what do you think about trading back and um, trying to get some assets? And I appreciate the call. Yep. Thanks, Kevin. Um, good question. Um, I think that would actually make a lot of sense. I, obviously, it's dependent on, on how the scouts feel about Reddish and, and Culver and the rest of those guys near the top. Um, but I think that would make a lot of sense, depending if you have somebody that wants to jump up um, and, and a player that they like. The issue is, it, and it always sounds good, uh, you know, in, in theory, in order for you to jump backwards, that, that requires another team wanting to move up. Right. Uh, Whereas if there's a drop off, you know, from tier one to tier two and a big drop off after tier three, it's usually it's typically unlikely that another team is willing to trade up. But I agree with you that it would definitely make a lot of sense to at least explore every opportunity um, to, to, to see if that's a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, you, you got Atlanta sitting there with potentially uh, two two first rounders. Yeah. Um, the Celtics will, will have three first rounders. So you, so How you do have... you not run out of first round? <laughs> it's Danny Ainge, ah. man. It's Danny Ainge, the, the riverboat gambler, man. I'm, t- I'm telling you. That that guy has been the executive of the decade, man. Give him credit. De- definitely give him credit. Um, Tommy, just keep me posted on, on the time. Um, Ernesto from the chat says, if the Knicks end up with the fifth pick, who would you draft and which combo of top free agents would you like to sign? Um, I think if they if they drop to five I, again, I would I would assuming that um, Morant and the, you know the, and the two guys are off the board. Culver would be the guy I'd lean towards. Um, you know, it, again, I think you know Culver kind of fits in that nice you know the, the, a lot of it. The, the thing about the NBA that draft that kind of complicates matters a little bit is it's before free agency. Yep. Um, you know, and so, I've been arguing like football, they it has to go the other way around, man. Yeah, it has to be free agency first. Then once you strike out, then you could really draft for need. Exactly. Um, so, you know, there's obviously a lot of, of uh, you know, uncertainty there. Um, you assume that, you know, by the late June, the Knicks will have a good indication of what, you know, Durant's idea will be um, through obviously nothing official, but, you know, via backdoor channels. And, and to somebody's point, as I was listening before I hopped on, um, relying on Kevin Durant, because I, I think we could all agree that, that Mills and Perry and the Knicks front office have, it given, have been given an indication that Durant is either likely to sign or heavily considering signing. Mm-hmm. But it's March 9th right now. The shout out to Biggie. Um, yep. And, you know, so, but, and there's, there's still three months, you know, even if Kevin Durant told them on June 30, uh, June 31st, uh, June 30th at, at, at 1159, hey guys, I'm signing with you. On July 1st at 1201, he Somebody might change his mind. Yep. So, there's just so so much uncertainty there that it just makes it really hard to predict. Uh, until he signs, you, you just don't know, JLs. Just uh, don't. Until he signs, you just don't know. Tommy, a, as a media guy, um, what do you think about? There's been so much talk about, you know, Kyrie and Kevin Durant and and their, um, I guess, displeasure with the media treatment about the the rumors and and stuff like that, and kind of the backlash and all that. What what, what do you take on that as a fellow writer? Um, what's your, what's your opinion on, on that backlash? Sure. Um, and I think it's a good debate to have. It's worthy of a conversation. I'll start off by saying that, um, most, a lot of the media, it's ridiculous how, how concerned, overly concerned they are with clickbait and mm. dumb questions Thank you. <laughs> and, 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 and stupid, um, you know, innuendo and rumors yeah. and who, who let's overhear a guy's having a conversational hallway. That definitely means they're going to team <laughs> right. <up>. Um, <laughs> so all that stuff is ridiculous. And I, but I understand, you know, the, the media parent companies under, they, it's very difficult to monetize on how, you know, how, how to, you know, people with readership and newspapers for them. So mm-hmm. all, that, all that aside, I totally understand a player's perspective that it's a pain to deal with annoying, idiotic, immature media members. I totally get that. They have every right. That being said, they get paid a lot of money to do what they do. Yeah. And, yeah. and part of their contract includes, it's in the CBA. You have to either before shoot around or after shoot around. And after each game, you don't even have to do it before games now. It's just after each game. Mm-hmm. You have to avail yourself to the media for, I think it's like eight minutes or whatever the case is. Mm-hmm. So let's say that's a half an hour a week. 
to be, you know, if you don't want to have to deal with that trauma, I totally understand it. My, 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 uh, my church league team could use a fifth. You're going to have to take a little bit of a pay cut, um, but we'll chip in five or 10 bucks a piece, you know, to, yeah. to, to bring Kyrie. Um, so it's a fine line. You walk there. Um, you can't complain about the media because the media generate helps to obviously their talents first and foremost, but the media helps to generate off season conversation, um, mm -hmm. rankings lists, um, mm -hmm. We're talking about the Knicks right now on a nice afternoon on a Saturday because yep. so many people have a vested interest in it. Mm -hmm. And that vested interest helps sell tickets. The ticket sales and jersey sales and, and clothing and hat sales all go into the big pot of money that pays these guys $20 million a year to play hoop. You yeah. know, so if you if you take the money for, for for hooping, you have to go with that other stuff that goes with it. And that other stuff that goes with it is dealing with the annoying media. Um, so I have a difficult time feeling too bad for a guy. Again, if you, if it's, it, it, it's every right, you have every single right in the world to say, I'm not going to answer questions. So mm -hmm. then you can take a fine and donate that money to charity, or you can choose not to play in the NBA. Nobody's going to bother you when I have a bad game on Thursday night. Nobody's <laughs> gonna ask me, Yo, how did you play? How come you missed that three, son? Yeah, right, like, right. Cares, but I got to pay $5 a night to reserve court time as it, as opposed to being paid. Five hundred thousand dollars a game. That's that's the that's the I think that the pros and the cons of. comes with the territory, JL. I'm looking for I'm looking for a place to ball. I haven't balled in a minute, Tom. So, <laughs> let me know, LA Fitness. We you know we put, we we always need a fourth. Yeah, so. I'm, I'm an LA Fitness All Star myself, man. They call I, me they call me Half Court Havoc at, at my location, man. You know, I'm gonna stretch out. I can't I can't play full court time. games no more. I'm just half courting it, man. That that that's it, man. Amen. I can do full court strong one minute and a half. Full yeah. Court. <laughs> After that, it's over with, man. Um, Yao Song in the chat says, do you trust Perry to make the right moves this summer, Tommy? Do you, how, how do you feel about Scott Perry so far, his tenure? So yeah, far? I, I, I think Nick fans have every reason to be just very, very pessimistic. A lot of Nick fans, rightfully so, understandably so, when the Knicks made the Porzingis trade is, yeah, you got $70 million in cap space, but I've heard this song before and I've been burned you know, okay, we're going to get LeBron and Bosch and Wade, and we end up with a Mars Stott and Mars bad knees for $100 million. Yeah. Uh, you know, it just it's happened time and time and time again. I think, yes, those are fair concerns. On the other side of the coin, it'd be really hard not to credit Perry for what he's done. I think Steve Mills being there makes Nick fans a little nervous because yes. he, you know, the, the Tim Hardaway contract is a disaster, as we all know. Yeah. Um, and Mills probably should have zero impact on the decision-making. But if you look at it from the day Perry was hired, um, obviously Mills was responsible for the two awful Hardaway Jr. And, and Baker contracts. From the day Perry was signed forward, they've been a well-run, successful, smart, forward-thinking franchise. Um, the Noah Vaughn like pickup, you know, mm -hmm. the guys they picked up on the margins have been, you know, have been successful. And obviously the draft, they had the ninth pick in the draft, the 36th overall pick in the draft, and they walked away from draft day. With Kevin Knox struggling, be it, but you mm -hmm. know, still some positive upside. Obviously, Mitch Robinson, who is uh, the steal of the draft. I don't think anyone would debate that at this point. Um, and then also Alonzo Trier, yeah. uh, you yeah. know, as a free agent afterwards. So um, it's hard to not consider that a grand slam. Um, and uh, and again, the, the they they haven't they have seven first round picks in the next five years. They haven't traded away a first round pick. They've maintained their cap space. They enter the season one of the you know more talented free agent crops we've seen in recent NBA history mm -hmm. and they have more cap space than any other team um, on the market and they play in New York so um, while it's understandable to be apprehensive given the Knicks history I think there's also reason to be optimistic given Perry's decision since the day he took over your boy Ninja P, J. Ellis. That, yeah, that, that's what you call it, man. But oh, listen, yeah. um, uh, Perry's been been building that that treasure chest, man. What what move has he made that you don't like this season? I can't name one. I, I think the 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 Mario Hazonia. Complicated name. Super but other, Mario. But other than that, you know, he's, he's still batting uh, a solid seven hundred or so. So that, yeah. that's that's <laughs> But why why not, man? Why not? Um. How about the Frank situation? Uh, Berman of the Post, and, and we've been hearing it all all year, basically, that, yeah. you know, they've been trying to trade him. We heard after the trade deadline that Orlando wants him. I just continue to feel, Tommy, that point guard at the point guard that they bring in and play over this kid, 
They don't have confidence in him at the point guard position. And it just doesn't seem like they have much confidence in him. You know, obviously he's he's been giving them reason to not. But what, what's your whole take on the on the Frank situation these last few years and, and how it's going to play out? I am one of the few, the proud, the remaining Neil Aquina Island survivors. <laughs> um, I'm with you. I get I get stuff every other week from the chat for uh, not trashing Frank. Yeah, we, we have Frank Neil Aquina telethons almost every other game when, when he doesn't play. So be careful. They're going to turn on you. Facts, <laughs> facts. Neil Aquina slander will not be tolerated while I'm <laughs> on, uh, bringing on. No, but um, listen, he has not been bad offensively. He's been atrocious, terrible, whatever. I don't have the Stephen A. Smith vocabulary to use the words as bad as, <laughs> as, bad as he's been offensively. There's no denying that. Mm-hmm. Um, if he doesn't, if he doesn't, and he can't, he doesn't. To ask him to be a good offensive player right now is un, is an unrealistic stretch. He needs to go from awful to bad. If he's just a bad offensive player, I think he can be a valuable off- a valuable NBA player. So he, here's my thinking with Neil Aquina. Um, and I tweeted this earlier today um, th- because of Fox hit those two early threes in the first quarter. Smith went underneath the screens, didn't challenge, um, and, 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 and Fox knocked down two of those first – had eight points like the first two minutes or whatever, um, finished with 30, a career high. Um, in today's NBA, the three-point line is very, very important. Nobody disputes that. But what gets lost, it's not the ability just to make three-pointers. It's the ability to stop your opponent from yeah. making three-pointers. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So if you so if you have a guy that's a, a, a an elite perimeter defender, and as a, as a rookie, as an 18-year-old rookie, Frank was an elite perimeter defender, not just a good perimeter defender. You know, in terms of – you look at the synergy numbers, um, was second in the NBA in terms of on-the-ball defense on pick-and-rolls. When, his, when the bull hitter, as the primary defender, only Drew Holiday was the only guy ahead of him. If you The analytics back it up, um, as, as the eye test does, um, that Frank was an elite perimeter defender. Now, um, again, he, part of this is he has to – if he can ever develop a league average three-pointer, which personally, I think he can. He shot 40% from three-point range in the French Pro A League um, mm-hmm. as a teenager. Shot the ball well. Um, you know, was around like a, a 55% true shooting percentage in international competition um, against top t- top competition was in France. Was terrible as a rookie, but if you look at his mechanics, there's no hitch, elbow alignment, everything you kind of want from a scouting perspective, it's there. Mm. Person, I think his confidence is shot. shot. He's, he's mm-hmm. never recovered. I don't shot. think the I don't think the coaching staff has done a good job supporting him yeah. and putting him in position to succeed. Part of that's you know on him. Part of that's on the coaching staff. But again, assuming he can be a decent offensive, decent, not good, a decent offensive player, you a guy like that is very valuable, especially, let's say, best case scenario, Knicks get KD, Zion, um, or Barrett, mm-hmm. and, and another top tier free agent. Is that Kemba? Is that Kyrie? Is that Jimmy Butler for less than the max, hopefully? Mm-hmm. Um, but you no, know, KD says, I, I, I'm coming. I just need one more guy with me. Okay, if the Knicks have to overpay for Kyrie or whatever the case might be, they, they, they max out Kyrie, they do what they got to do. In that dream scenario, best case scenario, which isn't, a, 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 you know, it, certainly it, it seems somewhat plausible. In that best case scenario, do you want a guy like Dennis Smith Jr. if you already have Durant, right. Kevin Knox, uh, um, Kemba Walker? You don't need another scorer. What you need is a guy that's willing to stand in the corner on offense and then guard the other team's best perimeter player on defense. Mm-hmm. So he can rest, so Kemba can rest, so or Kyrie can rest. Um, I personally would love to see that, that five-man unit with, with um, Neil Aquina on the floor and Mitch Robinson on the back end. Um, therefore, you have a nice balance of offensive guys that you can focus offensively. Um, and then you have uh, Neil Aquino who can stand in the corner and hopefully knock down corner threes. I mean – Andre Robertson is a 35% free throw shooter. He mm. just signed a $40 million, con- $30 wow. million contract with the Thunder. He's an important piece for their puzzle. Yeah. And he was afraid to shoot free throws. You know, mm. um, Tony Allen was first team all defensive player, but he was a valuable player in the NBA because he was, and it was a winning player in the NBA, even though he was a net big time net negative offensively. Mm-hmm. There, there's a spot in the NBA. The Knicks, if again, in their best case scenario, um, are going to need somebody that doesn't require the ball and that doesn't require a lot of money. Um, and I think that kind of sets up well for Neil Aquino going forward. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, I think to, to your point, once this team improves the talent, you know, I've been saying this, I think you'll see the value of Frank. But Jay Ellis, you know, it's no secret. His shot is way off. His confidence yeah. is definitely shot. Um, whether the, this coach or, or the secret sauce of Craig Robinson just hasn't been working, I just feel like we should just keep him because I don't see us getting anything of value for him. We're definitely not getting a first nope. for him. So why nope. not just keep him? You have him on the cheap. Keep them and just let the development play out. Uh, your thoughts, Shales? Yeah, I'm kind of with you. You know, I, you know where I am. I yeah. know it seems like the writing is on the wall because the way Fizz is kind of overlooking him a lot, and you figure that the front office might be trying to like give Fizz the, the players that he wants. So it seems like the writing might be on the wall for Frank. But um, like I said before, we don't know what's going to happen in the offseason. Moody might be moved. Who knows? But I really like Frank's long-term potential. Whether, he, whether he's here or not, I agree with Tommy that the, the jump shot is going to fall. Before he even went down, he was shooting around 40% from three. And I think he took down to like 38. And he started shooting like that in the beginning of the season as well before his, his confidence went there. So I do believe he was able to be a really, really consistent three-point threat. It's just he just needs time and he needs, he needs that confidence, man. And, and I hope the Knicks were able to give it to him at some point. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, I, I think it's important to point out, as you guys said, he's the type of player that looks good playing alongside good players. Right. Mm-hmm. Whereas Moody A and, and uh, uh, Dennis Smith Jr. to a certain extent look good playing alongside a bad team where they can get up their points and get up their shots. Mm-hmm. What Moody A does well and what he brings to the table, um, it kind of gets lost in the sauce when, you, when you're on a bad losing team that doesn't that isn't surrounded by other players. I tell you, man, that this fan base is ready to run Moody out of here. The f- the first bus out on April tenth, Jalis. <laughs> <laughs> Moody has to be a goner. Um, one last question, if you have time, Tommy. One last one. Let's do it. All right, uh, my guy Alex Collins. Shout out, my guy Alex Collins. He checks in on this show every night from Ireland. Yeah, man. Live post game. Um, he wants to know your thoughts on Damian Dotson. What's your take on Dotson, and what's your role? Uh, what do you see? How do you see his role um, kind of um, developing uh, over time? First off, respect to all fans overseas, um, people staying up to two, three in the morning to Absolutely, watch games. Um, yeah, a, lot, a lot of credit to those guys. Um, I think um, I think Dotson is a good player. Um, I don't know exactly what his upside is in terms. Of, I don't, you know, I think he can be a solid seventh, eighth guy in a rotation. Um, I, uh, you know, brings a little bit to, to on both ends of the floor. Is able to defend well on the perimeter, um, which is something you don't see a lot from the Knicks these days. Um, again, I think it's difficult to um, you know to look too closely at the numbers, um, you know, defensive rating, etc. When you're playing alongside guys like Knox and mm. and. His, of the world, um, you know, that, that struggled defensively. Um, obviously, you know, Dotson is, you know, his success is going to be is, you know, if he can consistently um, knock down the three pointer, you know, be above average, you know, three point shooter um, as he's done this season. So they have him locked in at, uh, I think it's 1.8 or around there, under 2 million um, with the team option next season. So um, if they were to cut him loose and wave him, it would only clear, I think, 700,000 or so yeah. in the. So, so I, I expect them to hold on to him, um, exercise that team option. And, um, you know, depending on who the Knicks bring in, obviously, if they really reshuffle the deck, they're going to need um, and, and dedicate the majority of their cash space to a stud like Durant and another max level player. Mm-hmm. You're going to need valuable contributors on minimal level contracts. So that's why guys like um, Mitchell Robinson and the Dotsons and, and, and uh, Alonzo Triers, et cetera, um, we'll have a you know extra value. JLs, you know that that's our guy, man. Free yeah, dot, free, you know. Um, I, I see him as as a good solid rotational piece as well. Um, obviously, you want to see him be a more consistent shooter, especially from three. But uh, you know, you, you love how they run those those uh, curl screens for him. And yeah, and, uh, yeah you know, his, his off ball defense kind of gets you know he kind of slacks off a little bit, kind of loses his man a little bit. But I, I like dots, man. Um, go ahead, wrap up with, with dots and JLs. Yeah, man. Best case scenario, Clay Thompson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Can't dribble that much. Get a few threes a few times. I feel like he needs to work on his um finishing around the rim. I, I feel like he's kind of been missing a lot of those. Mm-hmm. But overall, I really love his two-way potential. I really love the way he plays defense on a perimeter. And I think he has like a little bit. I, I feel like it's a, it's a hint, a hint of a clutch gene in there. Mm. There's a hint of a clutch gene. The game is on the line. I think we might be able to hit a corner three or two. 
I think that's that's in him. It remains to be seen though if he's if he's ever that level or he just up being a good rotational guy. Yeah. Bare minimum, he'll be a great rotational guy. Yeah. Now nah, that Dotson's our guy, man. Dotson's our guy. Well, Tommy, man, it was definitely great to have you on. You definitely dropped a lot of gems on this show. Uh, yeah, we appreciate the value that you brought to us, man. Hopefully, you'll you'll come back again, and maybe after the lottery, we'll talk some drafts, some more. Um, continued success con- and, and continued luck to you. As is a custom on the show, I'll put the camera on you, and you could just tell everybody where to find you at. And um, yeah, pretty appreciate it again, man. Appreciate you. Thanks for having me on, fellas. Um, great talking. Always always down for some intelligent, informed, um, passionate Knicks conversation. So um, thanks for having me on. And uh, yeah, Tommy Beer on Twitter. Um, a lot of nerdy stats and, and stuff like that. <laughs> yes. Um, you guys, uh, <laughs> thanks for having me on, fellas. Be good. Oh, man. Right. Tommy, appreciate you again, man. And hey, that was Tommy Beer, yeah. Force Magazine contributor, NBA writer. Um, awesome guest. Great guest. Great guest, JLC. Sell the team. Anything I should sell, sell the team? It. You want to not come to any more games? Why? Man, that's rude. It's an opinion. Yeah, no, it's not an opinion. And you know what? Enjoy watching them on TV. Him. Him. What? <laughs>